What's up, everybody? I hope you guys are doing great. Uh, my name is Shayun, one of the pastors here at One Shot Church. Uh, every time that we get together, we're excited to welcome you uh, back into this space, digitally for now, uh, but back into this space where we can focus our attention on Jesus, shutting out all other distractions, and seeing what it's like to be reminded that the most real, the, 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 the greatest source of love, of hope, of peace, of joy that we have is found in God through his son, Jesus Christ himself. So uh, that's our whole goal. When we come together as a community is that we remind one another, we point one another back into the direction of God because uh, throughout the week, I don't know if you're at work, if you're at school, if you got work and school, if you got kids, if you don't got kids, if you got bills, if, whatever's going on, uh, there's many things that pull us away, that pull us away from what we should be most focused on and today, uh, I'm honored. Today, we have the privilege of doing this together, not just me, but you uh, doing this together, pointing attention back to what we should be most reminded of, that God is real, that God is with us, and God desires every day to be closer and closer to us. So uh, let's do that here this morning. Uh, I want to pray before I begin, and, and, and hopefully, you know, the whole goal is when, when, when we put together a sermon or a message, you got so many things you want to say, and you run out of time. So I don't want to run out of time today, so let's pray, and then we will jump right back into this amazing series we have. So if you guys wouldn't mind, let's pray together. God, we thank you so much. We thank you for being real, number one, for being a, a, a God who we don't have to wonder if you're awake, if you're alive, if you are have ears open to hear us when we pray to you. So God, I pray today. Um, that as we spend time going through your scriptures, as we spend time uh, seeking your face, seeking to know you more, God, might you open our hearts, might you open our minds, might you open our eyes to see you like never before. God, we thank you that our hope arises when we look into your scriptures, when we hear about your love for us, might our hope arise. I pray for those who feel hopeless this morning, God, that they would be restored, uh, that their confidence would be renewed in a God who loves them and who is always there for them. It's in your matchless name we pray, Lord Jesus, everybody said. Amen. 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 So uh, today we're picking back up on this series we have called Beneath the Surface. Uh, and the whole point about Beneath the Surface is that we would put ourselves again into the footsteps of Jesus, following after him, following after the conversations that he had, following after the different miracles that he did, following after the path that he has left us in his scripture. And the beauty is this, that as we follow Jesus, we, we learn this that the majority of the time it's like uh, the iceberg where you know we just see the tip of the iceberg above the water but beneath the surface there is so much more that Jesus has in store for us and and as I was preparing this what I realized is um, Jesus reminds me of what I love about rap music too is uh, rap music oftentimes you'll hear you'll hear a bar you'll hear a part of a verse or you'll hear a snippet from a song and then you'll be thinking about it much later and be like oh dang I ain't realized that they had said that and and when it dawns on you you realize that beneath the surface they often have multiple meanings for one thing that's being communicated and here today as we go back uh, you'll see that this is a continuation of my, my the first part, which was hashtag blessed, or it's me taking a, a jaunt, a little journey through the Beatitudes. Uh, this will be the second part talking about the Beatitudes. And uh, this was this sermon that Jesus delivered. And what I learned from that sermon is, man, Jesus would be a phenomenal rapper, wouldn't he? Because oftentimes Jesus says one thing and then it'll hit you like much later, like, oh, dang, I didn't realize Jesus was really trying to say. And, and when we look at the Beatitudes, I think it's a perfect example of just that, that at the surface level, you will see them one way. But as we continue, as we read more, as we study, as we unpack, there's multiple meanings, there's multiple truths, there's multiple bits of hope that Jesus wants to offer us to grab a hold of. So today, as we jump back into Matthew chapter five, we're taking this journey of understanding what does it mean to be blessed? 
And to know uh, my definition for being blessed, of course, it means to be happy. It means to be fulfilled. It means to find uh, joy and contentment and all of these attitudes and emotions. And oftentimes we think that blessings are attributed to what we can attain, things we can grab, things we can hold with our hands. And Jesus is trying to say your definition of blessing is usually and most often the exact opposite of how I would define it. So as we go to Matthew chapter five today, our focus is going to be on verse number four. Uh, and, and I truly believe there's two meanings here beneath the surface. Jesus, this is, this is uh, another bar that Jesus drops. And as he drops this bar, I realize that there's multiple ways we can look at it. But from both of these ways, there will be great truth that hopefully will enlighten us, will encourage us and teach us what it means to grab a tighter hold of our savior. So as we open up Matthew chapter five, it starts saying and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we did, you know, multiple unpackings of that last time when we were together. How many sermons, how many talks about God open up saying you are rich, you're going to be rich. Your bank account is coming fooled with zeros and all of these things versus Jesus saying, blessed are the poor. And verse four, where we focus today, it says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I thought this was extremely fitting because as I look back at the last two years, and, and maybe it's part of me getting older, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm 34 going on 35, and it's hard to think about that or rationalize it. But I think the more time you spend on this earth, the more opportunity you have to be acquainted with mourning. And what I do not want to do if you're if, if you're watching this here today is to assume that I understand what you're going through. But I do know this, that these past two years have been filled with more pain, with more hardship and more struggles for a number of people in my direct circle and likely many people in your circle that this past season has be, been filled with more difficulty than I've been accustomed to for the majority of my life that people are going through hard times. And I believe what Jesus is offering beneath the surface of this beatitude, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted, is instructions for what it looks like to deal with difficulty in our lives. That the Bible, that God himself, he does not desire for you to think that you should approach difficult seasons on your own. Because the lie, the trick of the enemy is that you would go through difficulty and then you would seek isolation. God is trying to say something very, very different. That in the midst of difficulty, his goodness should be shown and will shine through all the more. So uh, as we unpack, blessed are those who mourn. And, and I think, again, many people think, there is no blessing in mourning. So Jesus, what are you talking about? Again, he's dropping a bar. He, he, he's spitting a verse here. He's saying, blessed are those who mourn. And he's just taking what most people think is that you're cursed if you're mourn and you're blessed when you rejoice. And he's flipping that on his head because he's saying there is comfort coming for those who mourn. And I believe there's two definitions that we can unpack. And the first one we see, let's approach it in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Seven, and we will go to verse 8, 2 Corinthians 7, 8. It starts out saying, I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. And to set the scene or the backdrop, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to this church at Corinth. And, and, and I think about it when I, when I uh, encounter these letters that he's writing to, these church, to this church at Corinth, uh, oftentimes it's a struggle <laughs> when I read it. I look at Paul, I'm like, Paul, what you talking about, bro? Paul, what's your problem? Paul, what's going on with you? He says some difficult things to understand. Sometimes he says some harsh things and he's acknowledging that right here in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, he said, uh, I, I, I'm not sorry that I sent this severe letter to you. He says, I was sorry for a little while. Verse nine, we pick up, it says, now I am glad I sent it. 
not because it hurts you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. As we see here, Paul talking about and giving reference to a letter that he wrote to this church in Corinth. And he wrote it in, we see it as 1 Corinthians. This is his second letter we're reading from. And he's saying, you know, I felt bad for a little while because I said some very harsh, quote unquote, or severe things in this first letter. But he's saying that there's something different about this kind of sorrow or this kind of mourning. And I love how it's phrased at the end of verse nine. It says it was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. Blessed are those who mourn which means I believe there is a type of mourning that God says he finds and we will find joy in. We will find joy in. It says this kind of sorrow God desires for his people to have. That Paul was like, man, I'm not sure. Uh, but God is saying there is a joy that comes from this type of sorrow. And why is that? Why is that? It's because just what he says here in these verses as well. He says that it was because the pain caused you to repent and to change your ways. I believe that the first way to look at mourning when Jesus is unpacking it in Matthew 5, 4 is those who mourn because of sin. Those who mourn or, or find sorrow in what's happening. And when Paul referenced this severe letter here in, in verse 8, I, I was like, okay, what's he talking about? There's many examples you can see, but I just want us to brush on this one. I'm not going to park here because, again, I'm not trying to wrap you up too much. We don't want to spend too much time, but we're going to put a pin in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8 and we're going to jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and we're going to pick up in chapter 5 because chapter 5 paints a picture of why did Paul need to write a severe letter to the church at Corinth? Why did Paul need to write that letter? And as we pick up 1 Corinthians now chapter 5 we're going to read verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 5 1 and 2 okay if you got a seat belt just uh Strap this in because we're going to see why did Paul need to write a severe letter to the church at Corinth? He says, verse one, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. And here we go. We're going to unpack this. He says, you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame and you should remove this man from your fellowship. If you were to take your time and read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you will see what is some of this severe letter that Paul wrote to them in, 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 in this, to this church in Corinth. What is included in that letter and why did he need to write it? He is addressing some issues that arose in this church. And one issue we see here in chapter 5 is he's saying that there is a son who is involved in sexual immorality with his own stepmother. Or it's a son who is sleeping with his father's wife. Oh, this is an issue. Paul's saying, man, there's some, there's some drama. There's some craziness going on. We're not just going to call it craziness. There is sin taking place inside of your church. And instead of responding, like he said here in verse 1, instead of responding with mourning and sorrow and shame, it says that you are proud of yourself. When we say blessed are those who mourn, he's saying that there is something about understanding and acknowledging sin and saying that this is a condition that should lead me to be sorrowful because of the ultimate end. But so much of our world will push you to say, nah, it's cool. You know, let's brush over these sins. Let's let's overlook them. Let's turn our back on them. But uh, what what I believe Paul is saying is the same thing that Jesus is expressing as he's where we're looking at Matthew 5, 4 there where it says blessed are those who mourn Paul is saying because of these sins you should be drawn to moral to mourning and sorrow and shame yet you're proud here we go let's jump down we're going to stay in first Corinthians 5 we're going to jump down to verse 11 if you have time you know 
I'm not one for giving out homework, but I'm going to try and give out a little bit of homework here today. If you have time, feel free to read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Take a look at the context. What is it that Paul is saying that was so severe that he's referring to in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 that we saw? We're jumping down. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Now it says, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people don't even eat with such people uh oh <laughs> paul is giving instructions to this church he's telling them about how serious of a perspective we should take when it comes to sin and sin being in our lives verse 12 let's pick it up it says it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. I remember when I was in uh, undergrad, uh, my, my, my good man, Pastor B, he, he, he was sharing some things with me. He was a young adult pastor at that time. Now shout out his church, Macedonia, the mighty Macedonia back in Pittsburgh. And, and Pastor Brian was sharing with me. He said, what do you think is one of the most quoted verses from the Bible? And a lot of people will say John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Or you say Jesus wept from later on in John. But he was saying, no, you know what it is? It's 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 a verse that says, judge not lest ye be judged. That so many things about our culture is saying, I don't want to be judged, that you shouldn't judge me, that it's not right for you to judge. And, and, and I think that the twist here is to understand Paul is saying that judgment is right when it comes to those who call themselves believers and who are inside, inside the church. He's saying that there is a judgment that should take place, that there is an amount of sorrow that we should be willing to inflict when we are able to confront sin so that it might lead to repentance and a turning back to the things of God. A few thoughts of, uh, of what I was thinking about is that some of us, we may have been through seasons like this, or we may be in seasons right now. It says some of us are still happy over our sin or envious of the sinful lifestyles of others around us. Some of us are still in that place where our sin doesn't lead us to sorrow. Our sin is like, you know, I'm just doing my thing. It is what it is. You know, God knows my heart. So many of these things or or we're envious of, man, look at my friend over there. She's doing her thing and whatever she's sinning. She's doing all this stuff, but she seems to be blessed. Or look at my friend, man, he's stealing. He's he, he's running scams. You know what I'm saying? What are them PPE loans? I don't whatever. He, he's getting loans. He's getting money. He's doing all these things and he seems to be blessed. And now I'm envious of of something sinful but God is saying wait a minute here to realize that at the end of this those who mourn those who mourn who see sin and they realize that the impact of sin is deadly that the impact of sin is separation from God those who mourn and long for repentance that he says you will ultimately be comforted those who find blessings in sin will realize that it is a very short-lived feeling of enjoyment. It is a very short-lived outcome that you may get, but to realize that you will be removed from ultimate comfort, which can only be found in the arms of our loving God. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin because they realize it's not about a short-term gain. It's about a long-term perspective of what does eternity look like. Sorrowful, uh, sorrowful reminders and expressions about sin is what will lead us to everlasting life and everlasting joy and true blessedness with our Father God. We're in a culture these days that uh, it cancels people so quickly on a whim. It's, you know, everybody's getting canceled left and right and Dave Chappelle and the baby and so many people rightfully so for some, maybe not so rightfully so for others, but we're so quick to cancel people. But the question is, have we become too accepting as a, as a church? Have we become too accepting inside of the church when, when there's a holy, a perfect, and a righteous God who is not accepting of sin? He seeks to change us. That's God's goal. 
when, when we should be judging and calling out and letting people understand that, no, it's not about you just feeling good and me making you feel uh, like everything's all right so I don't get canceled. It's saying, no, no, no. God calls that sin. I call that sin in response. And because I call it sin, it's not because God hates you. It's because God loves you and he desires for you to experience what true comfort looks like. Some people think I'm blessed. I'm comforted if I can do me, if I can just be who I am. God is saying, no, you're blessed. You're truly comforted if you mourn over your sin, if you mourn over who you are, because his desire is to transform you into something completely new, something completely new. Let's jump back if we can. We're going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We read uh, verses 8 and 9, and I just want to finish with verses, um, verses 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. We're talking about godly sorrow here. It says, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us what it leads us away from sin and it results in salvation. There's a mourning that God desires when we look at sin. And that mourning, that sorrowfulness, it leads us away from sin and it results in salvation. There's a line drawn in the sand that Paul's saying, yeah, you know, I wrote this severe letter, but I'm happy that it led you to a place of mourning. Not because I'm evil and I want to hurt you, but because I truly see the ultimate gain is you turning back to God. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. In verse 11, just see what this godly sorrow produced in you, what it produced in me, what it produced in those who have been called by God. Godly sorrow, it says it produced such earnestness, such concern to clear yourselves, such in indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, such a readiness to punish wrong. You show that you have done everything necessary to make things right. Godly sorrow produces the necessary response to see how serious the things of God are. The worldly sorrow, the, the worldly definition of blessings is, man, do whatever you want. Live it up while you can. Live it and life is going to last forever. Godly sorrow says, no, there's an alarm. There's, there's something that's ringing off. Wake up. God is saying, turn to me, turn away from sin. Everlasting life is at hand. It is okay to understand that the gospel will bring sorrow to those who choose not to repent. And the gospel will bring sorrow to those who choose to repent. But that sorrow is a godly sorrow that leads to ultimate comfort. So that's the goal. Have you experienced godly sorrow that leads to forgiveness? A little bit of homework again, if you, if you desire to do it, there's an amazing psalm, Psalm chapter 73. Psalm 73, and we see the psalmist, and uh, he, he begins to walk through his experience of saying, man, I looked out at these people who, who seemed to live godless lives, who seemed to chase after pleasure, and it seemed like they were the ones who were not going through difficulty. It seemed like they were the ones who got everything they desired. In, in Psalm 73, uh, right here in verse 5, it says, they don't have troubles like other people. They are not plagued with problems like everyone else. That there's a group of people who are not pursuing God, but why is it they get everything they want? Why is it they seem so blessed? And then we see the psalmist transition in the middle where he says, man, I almost lost myself. I almost lost myself thinking that it's not worth it to pursue God, thinking that it's not worth it to believe that he said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. That it's not worth it for me to truly believe that. But verse 17 in the middle of that psalm, you should read the whole thing if you got time one day, one day this week read it psalm 73 it's a great great path laying out exactly what we're talking about verse 17 though it says in the middle it says i went into your sanctuary O god and i finally understood the destiny of the wicked god is concerned about our destiny about the ultimate outcome when you are mournful sorrowful over your sin 
It may seem like you're missing out on so many things that this life calls blessed, so many things that this life calls fun. But to know there is no blessedness and there is no fun that causes you to miss out on eternity where true joy and fulfillment and everlasting blessing is meant to be experienced. So uh, I, I didn't want to end there, though, but I'm rounding the corner. The, that's the first definition of sorrow. This, this understanding that sin is something to be mourned over. That sin is something that should cause me to literally say, God, no, I don't want this. I don't want any parts of this, but I need you. But there's a second definition, I believe, for mourning, which many of you have been very acquainted with, just as I shared, maybe over these past two years or maybe in this season of your life. You may be asking, where is God? You might be asking, why God? You might be saying, God, I'm done with this. God, I've been trying enough. God, I can't take any more. There's a mourning where your heart is broken when something you've been longing for has been stripped away. Maybe there's been a death in the family. Uh, maybe you've had a, a job that you desired and it didn't work out. There's been a relationship you placed your hope in and it fell apart. That leads to mourning. But I believe God is saying as well, it's not just a mourning over your sin, but when you're mourning in your life, when you feel like tomorrow's not going to come, when you feel like darkness is closing in, I, I, I'm telling you this, God is aware of those difficulties in that season. And what God is saying is either you're going to let that morning and that difficulty define who you are, or you will go through the process of dealing with that morning and still holding on to Jesus while you're in it. To know either mourning will define you or in the midst of you experiencing mourning, you will still allow Jesus to define you. So uh, I, I truly believe this, that when we experience pain in our lives, that pain comes. We shouldn't avoid it or ignore it. We shouldn't uh, brush it off. That pain comes. But to know pain is to be processed. But pain is not supposed to be possessed and held on to as a source of identity, but it is to be processed. So my goal as we close here today is to give you some protocols, some instructions for how is it that those who God calls blessed are supposed to process pain. We're not supposed to just hold on to it and, 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 and keep it with us, but we are to process it. And I believe that the processing of pain is different for a believer than it is for one who has no hope in God. So let's go. First verse I want to go to is James chapter one. James chapter one. How do we process pain? It says verse two. We start James chapter one, verse two. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it. Consider it. Here's a reframing, a, a, a different reference point God wants to give us for when pain comes. Here's a different reference point. He says, consider it an opportunity for great joy, great joy. He says, when pain comes, and here's the definition of the ultimate optimist. It comes from our God. It comes from his definition in his word, glass half empty or half full. He says, you're experiencing pain. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. And here we go again, the Bible dropping these little bars. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why should pain lead to joy? Glad you asked. Verse three, it says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. There's something you can learn about God from pain that you would never experience if you got everything that you desired exactly when you wanted it. I don't know why. I'm not God. I can't answer that. But I do believe that there is something different about the experience of pain in this life and holding on to God in that process. There's something new. So verse four, it says, so let it grow. He's talking about your endurance. He's talking about your faith being tested. He said, let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Maybe God is saying, your pain, your mourning is temporary. It's, it's, it's a moment in time. 
But it's not just that, because some of you, this moment in time has been extending far longer than you could ever think. So what I want you to add to the midst of your processing of your pain is an understanding that God has an ultimate perspective that is not limited to a point in time, but he sees your growth. He sees the end of the story. He sees that he is trying to complete and perfect you. And you see, man, God, just get me out of this moment. But he says, if you hold on, my child, there is something coming. There is comfort. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He says that you'll be developed and needing nothing. Let's jump down. James chapter 1, we'll jump down to verse 12. And here we go again. Blessed are those who mourn. Verse 12 starts, it says, God blesses those who do what? Who patiently endure testing and temptation. We would think God blesses those who he takes away all pain and temptation from right away. You, you, you are going through something because you backslidden and that's why you're going through that hardship. God is saying you're blessed. You are being blessed. You are in a process. He says he blesses those who patiently endure after they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. God has a promise in the middle of your process and the processing of your pain. There is a promise there. The promise is that he's with you. The promise is that there's eternity coming. The promise is that comfort is coming. The promise is a crown of life, everlasting life. God is seeking to give to those who endure. Let's keep going here. Second Corinthians chapter four, second Corinthians chapter four, and we're going to read verse 17 and 18. How do we process pain and hardship? Blessed are those who mourn. Verse 17 says for our present troubles. That's your trouble. That's my trouble. That's the, this extremely difficult season we're going through. It says the present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce. Here again, we're in a process. Something is being produced. It says, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Your present trouble is momentary in comparison to everlasting life with God. And some of you feel like this season is forever. God, just get me out of this season. He's saying, oh, no, no, no. Hold on, my child. Everlasting life is being produced from what you're going through in this instant. He says it's light and momentary. And in verse 18, he says, so we don't look at troubles we can see now. Some of us are overwhelmed by our trouble because we don't have the proper instructions for what mourning looks like. Mourning looks like being fully cognizant. We don't need to be numbed or dumbed down. It's okay. I'm going through the most difficult, the, 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 the greatest loss I have ever experienced. But what we add to that is we don't look at the troubles we can see now. We fix our gaze. We fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. They're light, they're momentary, they will soon be gone. The health challenge that you're experiencing right now that seems forever to know it will soon be gone because eternity's coming. The heartbreak that you feel right now, it'll soon be gone for eternity is coming. He says, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see This is eternity with our God. This is the comfort that is promised. This is everlasting life. The things we cannot see will last forever. In comparison to eternal glory, take your most difficult day, your most difficult season, the, the, the greatest amount of anxiety and worry you felt and how heavy was that? And it might seem to be the heaviest thing you've ever been through, but God is saying in comparison to his glory, in comparison to who he is, that thing is light. It's light as a feather compared to a hundred pound dumbbell. God's glory, his weightiness far outweighs any trouble, struggle, or pain we could ever experience. I've overdone it on my time again, which, which seems to always happen here. But I wanted to leave you with this last portion of scripture. And it's a bunch of verses. But what I'm going to try and do is just read through them and not stop. But Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53. 
And I think this is the, the, the perfect protocol for what it means to process our pain. It's found here in Isaiah 53. So if you are going through a difficult season, he's reminding us you are blessed when you mourn for you shall be comforted. Here's the source of our comfort. Isaiah 53, it says, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. Verse three, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Verse six, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Verse seven, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearer, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. Verse nine, he had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. We're almost there. Verse 11, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sin. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Comfort is coming because our King Jesus came down to be acquainted with all of our sorrow. If you're going through sorrow, blessed are those who mourn, for you will be comforted. That comfort is coming. It is offered to you right now in Jesus, and it's offered to you for eternity, an eternity of a life filled with the joy of being in the presence of our everlasting God. Might these scriptures bring you comfort to hold on to the everlasting comfort that's coming. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for what doesn't seem to compute or make sense in our brains, that you would minister to our spirits right now. God, might you speak to us to help us to understand true blessing, true joy, true happiness. It's found in you. God, I pray for those experiencing the most difficult times of their lives. It can be sickness in their body. It could be a broken heart. It could be anxiety and worry and uncertainty about the future. It can be loneliness and isolation. God, I pray for those going through. Comfort would be theirs. That the truth of your word would bring comfort to the darkest of situations. God, I pray for those who are clinging on and still holding on to the things of this world. God, I pray that sorrow would overcome them, that sin would no longer be comfortable, but they would only find true comfort in being turned away from their sins, from being judged by the perfect and righteous judge, which is our savior, and they would find true life. So God, I just pray for us this coming week, overwhelm us, overwhelm us 
with your word to overwhelm us with perspective to see eternity versus light and momentary suffering. It's in your matchless name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Hopefully you guys are still doing all right. I was doing a lot of rapping, man. I got to rest my throat, take some water. But I truly do pray a blessing over you for this coming week. Can't wait to be with you and share these things, the word of God, with you again. Take care. Peace.